basically association of molecular pathology and the myriad genetics. Uh, this is a case about patenting human genes. And uh, I have this picture on here. This one was a, a very active case politically, and my presentation is somewhat of a political presentation as well. Um, so this touches on uh, um, also where the court had sent uh, uh, to the federal to the court of appeals for the federal circuit asked them to look at. Uh, whether human uh, genes can be patented under the Prometheus standard and the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit ruled in favor of patent holders and the Supreme Court again made the, the poor decision. So this is just another one of those, in my opinion, uh, poor decisions by the Supreme Court. Obviously they're, they're very sophisticated people but I think sometimes they don't understand uh, science and they don't understand the patent laws. Um, the America Invents Act. So this is a piece of legislation I mentioned earlier uh, in 2012, I believe. Uh, it, it did a lot of things. It changed us from a first to invent to a first to file country. What that means is no longer were you able to submit declarations stating that you invented before the prior art that's being cited against you. We used to call that swearing behind. You can no longer swear behind prior art. We're now first to file. But also, and more importantly, it created these uh, post-grant challenges, these tribunals at, at the PTAP, uh, the Patent Trial and Appeal Board. And these include inter-parties review, or IPR, uh, post-grant review, and covered business method review. So what these essentially are, are opportunities for, um, for people to challenge patent rights without going through uh, what we call an Article III court under the Constitution and the right having a jury present to decide. So effectively, groups can circumvent the proper course of going through the courts by going to the PTAP. And uh, there's a good case we're going to touch on and whether that's constitutional or not. It's at the Supreme Court right now. Um, I don't think it looks too promising. Again, a little more doom and gloom. <laughs> um, so what's the result? This creates a lot of uncertainty, right? Uh, why would anyone want to spend time researching and developing and patenting anything if they don't know, number one, will they even receive a patent? And if they do, how long is that going to take? And if, and if they get it, is it even enforceable? And if it is enforceable, can they receive an injunction or is a court just going to, uh, by default, make them give someone a license that they don't want to give it to? Yeah. So it, nobody really knows. That's a lot of uncertainty and it, 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 in my opinion, stifles invention. It disincentivizes inventors. It disincentivizes investors. It uh, stops job creation. Um, it's really bad for, for uh, our country. Uh, I want to talk about this as well. So I've called this gaming the system. So believe it or not, this happens. Uh, there are those who file post-grant review proceedings in order to depress stock prices and extort settlements. That's true. And uh, it shouldn't be that way. The other thing is uh, there are those who will file repetitive petitions at the PTAB in order to specifically harass a particular patent holder or company. These are uh, just sort of the unintended consequences of what happened. I don't think Congress really knew this was going to happen. They couldn't anticipate any of this. They really had good intentions when creating the AIA, but it's just morphed into what it is, and, and we now have to look at it and fix it. Um, so I've got a couple pending cases I think I just want to touch on real quick. Uh, Helsin Healthcare v. Teva. So this one is about uh, 35 U.S.C. 102. That's uh, anticipation statute and in particular it's about the on sale bar. So what happened in this case is there was a sale to, or a sale to a, a marketing partner and the sale was confidential. Okay, they had a confidentiality agreement, but the marketing partner was a public company, so they had to file their 8K. And in the 8K, they had to disclose the sale, right? But they didn't disclose anything substantively about the invention, just the mere existence of a sale related to their, rela their commercial relationship, right? So uh, before the AIA, uh, the case law was pretty clear, and I've got the statute up here. A person shall be entitled to a patent unless the invention was on sale in this country before the critical day. So prior to the AIA, um, health and healthcare would have lost anyway. Uh, but post AIA, and, and this is one of the good things I think happened during the AIA, is uh, Congress talked specifically about, well, what, how do we address and fix the on sale bar for secret sales, sales made in, in confidence? Uh, so there was actually talk on the floor in Congress uh, about amending the language. 
And they did, and they put, a person shall be entitled to patent unless the claimed invention was on sale or otherwise available to the public. Yeah. In other words, their intent was, if you're going to disclose something to the public, that should prevent you from obtaining a patent. But if it's secret, if you keep it con uh, confidential, uh, maybe that shouldn't be affected. So that's, that's a plain reading of the statute. It, it is taken up by the, by the courts, and we'll, we'll see what the uh, Supreme Court says on that. I'm kind of interested to find out, actually, but I think it's pretty clear what they're going to say. Maybe they're just going to make it clear for the record. Uh, oh, by the way, if not, Congress can come back and change the statute, and that's what's going to have to happen. For any of these things, and I think Congress actually is going to need to take a proactive step to fix a lot of these issues. And we do that through legislation. We can't rely on the courts anymore. The courts got it all messed up, so we got to go back and have very clear and succinct uh, legislation in these, in these issues. So SAS, uh, so this is one uh, about the PTAB and what they can and can't do. And in, in, in the code, 35 U.S.C. 318, it actually says the Patent Trial and Appeal Board shall issue a final written decision with respect to the patentability of any patent claim challenged by the petitioner. Uh, in this case, uh, I think the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit actually got it wrong. They're usually, they usually get it right and the Supreme Court gets it wrong, but in this case I think the Federal Circuit got it wrong. What they basically said is that the PTAB is allowed to uh, give a written opinion only on the claims they find are, are, are necessary and proper, uh, but not all of the claims. So this uh, case brings the question whether the PTAB must provide the written uh, decision with respect to all of the claims. I think the uh, um, statute is pretty clear. I really think it's going to come down to reading the statutory language in the plain and ordinary meaning. This is the big case. This is the one that everyone's talking about. Uh, Oil States Energy Services v. Greens Energy Group. And it's not really about the technology. It's about the scope of the PTAB. And the Patent Trial and Appeal Board. What can they do? What can they not do? And again, it goes back to Art Article 3 courts and a right to a jury trial. And uh, some of the questions that have arised out of this case are whether patent rights are private rights or public rights. And I do want to get into that. Uh, I will say there was another case called MCM Portfolio uh, that the Federal Circuit found that patents are public rights. I think they got it wrong. Uh, we'll talk about why in a second here. Um, but uh, um, the Supreme Court didn't pick that one up. They didn't, they didn't take it to hear it. So. Okay, so why does it matter if it's a private right or a public right? Well, private property rights are subject to the takings clause of the Fifth Amendment, right? The government cannot take your private property without compensating you, right? Also, the Seventh Amendment, like I mentioned, Article Three, Court, you have a right, uh, before the government takes your property, you have a right to Article Three adjudication and a right to a jury unless you waive it. So that's, that's why it's important to distinguish uh, between private and public rights. Um, again, the Federal Circuit, current, present law at the Federal Circuit is that patents are public rights. I disagree with it, but current, current uh, sentiment. Um, so here's, here's my thoughts, and I've got a few things here. So the U.S. Constitution, um, in particular, it says to promote progress of science and useful arts. By the way, I think all of you have probably read it. If not, I'm going to read it to you. Article 1, Section 8, Clause A. It's one of the powers specifically enumerated to Congress on what they can do. Um, and, it means, and it says to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing, by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. Well, these rights are to authors and inventors. They're not to the public. It's not a public right, it's a private right. The Constitution authorized Congress to give private rights. Also, there's a case uh, called McCormick Harvesting Machines uh, v. Uh, Altman. It's a very old case. It's 1898. And uh, one of the counter arguments to anyone who asserts this case law is that it's very old and the statutes were not the same as they were back then. Um, the AIA did not exist back then. Um, so uh, what this one says, though, it's a Supreme Court uh, ruling, says the only authority competent to set a patent aside or to annul it or to correct it for any reason whatsoever is vested in the courts of the United States and not the department which issued the patent. In other words, it's saying the, the USPTO has no right to uh, take away the patent. Once it's, once it's granted, it's a property right, and the PTO no longer has the ability to uh, destroy it. Uh, so, I also I have a patent in my 
bag, I forgot to bring it up with me, but I was gonna read the cover to you, but the cover actually says on the cover of the ribbon copy of the patent, it says that the rights are given to the, t to the holder of title of this patent. It explicitly says that it's a private right given to this person. It doesn't say given a right to the public, it's given an exclusive, li exclusive right to the holder of title to that patent. So let's talk about the PTAB. So, uh, the Political Transmutations of Assets Bureau, um, also known as the PTAB. Um, they're not really the Political Transmutation of Assets Bureau, but it seems like they are. I mean, they're trying to take property and dispose of it at their will um, a lot of times. I think the PTAB offers a lot of, of good services, but I th you'll, as you'll find, but I think there are some things that need to be reformed at the PTAB. Um, but they are the Patent Trial and Appeal Board. And what we know about the Patent Trial and Appeal Board is with uh, ever since the AIA, cases have been amounting and recent, recent statistics show 23% of PTAB decisions are at least remanded in part uh, by the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. So they're, uh, they're doing okay, but they're not doing so well. In fact, they're often remanded for lack of evidence. They, they often make decisions without having the evidence before them, um, which is a huge no-no. Um, so again, my, these are my personal views and, and not so much law, but I think that the PTAB has some value added services, some services that are useful. Um, uh, Paul Morinville, I don't know how many of you know him, um, he actually introduced me to Adrian. And he's a friend of mine and I think he wants to eliminate the AIA completely and the PTAB completely. He's a good friend of mine, um, but I, I see some value in the, in the PTAB. But I see this value, ex parte appeals. If you are prosecuting your patent application with an examiner who is just difficult to work with, they're, they're not being objective and reasonable and you've come to a standstill, you really need that opportunity to take the case out of the um, docket of the examiner and place it before a board that, of more sophisticated uh, people. And so I think that uh, PTAP offers that as an excellent service. Also, if you're prosecuting a reissue and the same sort of thing happens, being able to have a board uh, to access is obviously a beneficial thing. Derivation proceedings. Uh, and there haven't been many of these. I, I filed the 21st derivation proceeding, at, and I think there's maybe only 23 or 24 ever. Um, but um, I did find they got my case wrong. Uh, just a quick note, uh, the, in the opinion that the USPTO gave, they did not institute the derivation proceeding, which by the way, is about finding out who an inventor is in a patent application, if you don't know. Uh, the, the PTAB uh, finds out or derives inventorship based on the facts that you submit. So we filed a derivation proceeding in a case and the judge, the PTAB judge, gave an order that said, well, at best you've shown that your, your client uh, contributed only two or three elements of the claim, but not the entire claim. And I found this to be uh, kind of confusing because as many of you might know, to be a named inventor, you only have to contribute one element of the claim. So if you contribute one element or a portion of that claim, you are an inventor on the patent. And the judge came out and said in the order, oh, you've, you've shown you know, two or three elements, but not all elements in the claim. And the judge just completely messed it up. Unfortunately, we didn't appeal to, the next level is to appeal in the district court. We didn't do it because my client didn't have the funding. So this is a situation where an inventor deserved something, the PTAB got it wrong, and due to cost, something being cost prohibitive, they were not able to take it uh, further. But on the right side over here, I have what I'm calling excessive devolution. Uh, I think there are certainly arguments to be made that perhaps the, uh, either procedures need to change and the PTAB needs to implement some other things to be more similar to Article III courts, or else perhaps they need to get rid of these IPR, CBM, and PGR um, altogether at the PTAB. So we'll find out what happens in oil states. Uh, and based on that, I think there's going to be a legislative correction. And, and hopefully, we can fix all this. So that's my uh, conclusion on the devolution of patent rights. I think we've seen uh, patent rights have become significantly weaker over time. But as I mentioned here, I think there is hope. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the Stronger Patents Act. So uh, what I want to do is just tell you a little bit the status. So I'm not sure how many of you follow legislation, how a bill eventually becomes law. I know you do. Um, so I've got a little diagram over here. Uh, the Stronger Patents Act was introduced recently, March 20th of 2018. It was referred to the Committee on Judiciary 
and Committee on Energy and Commerce, as would be expected. But uh, we're here. So we've got a long way to go. Uh, I wanted to illustrate that. My personal opinion, uh, I do follow this, and I don't think it's going to make it through the 115th Congress, which is Congress now. Um, it might not be until 2019 before it actually makes some significant progress. I think a lot of people are focused on the midterm elections and a lot of uh, more, um, uh, how would you say, polarized issues like illegal immigration, things like this. Um, so the content of this bill. So a couple of things I really, really like and support about the Stronger Patents Act. So it, try, it attempts to change the uh, rules at the PTAB so that they uh, act with the same standards as the district court uh, when ruling on validity of issued patents. Um, I, th I certainly think it, let's, let's uh, say this, the PTAB has educated patent examiners, scientific people, engineers, and, and they're, they're sophisticated in the science realm, right? And as opposed to the Supreme Court, which, you know, bless their hearts, I know they try to do well, they're just, in my opinion, not always up to speed on the technology aspect. So perhaps the PTAB has more sophistication and a better ability to adjudicate rights, but they have to follow the same standards uh, as an Article III court, in my opinion, in terms of procedure and evidence. So this uh, Stronger Patents Act it actually seeks to bring the PTAB a little more on par with those legal standards. Um, but also it restricts ability of challengers. So one of the things it mentions is you, won't, you cannot have standing to bring a, 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 a trial at the PTAB unless you have uh, been sued for infringement, if you're in a litigation, or served a letter if you've been threatened with the litigation. Um, also, it, re it seeks to reestablish the presumption of injunctive relief, which I really like. That, in my opinion, is one of the easiest and best things we can do right away. So I have this slide in here. It's time for a change. It, it, it really is. And the only, re the only way we're going to be able to solve these issues is to elect representatives like myself who actually care about patents and will work to support patent rights in Congress. Because it's such a big issue in my world. I've, I've dealt with it as a patent attorney, as a business owner, as an inventor myself. I know that it's the heart of our job creation engine. And that in itself affects our economy. Uh, I do believe President Trump understands that, and I think that um, he's pushing for it. We've, seen, we've heard about uh, uh, his discussions with China and intellectual property rights. Um, so anyway, we'll see how this pans out. But it, you really have to, when you, when you sit down and, and do your voting, think about you know, not just uh, illegal immigration and these hot button issues, but also the economy and really at the root of the economy, who's going to support patent rights? Because everybody in here, you know, it matters to you and it matters to me. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about my... Oh. What, who's, who introduced the bill and what's the number? I have the number, but his name, uh, there's, I don't have his name on top of my head, but I do have the number. Is this Massey's bill? Because there's two versions. There's a yeah. Senate version and a House version, and I can't remember which is We can get that to you. I'll get it to you, but okay. yeah, I, I do have it in my slides here somewhere. Um, so my vision, obviously, I support patents for individuals and small businesses, and I do think we can make patents great again. I am playing off of Trump's slogan there uh, um, because I am a Republican, but um, I do think we can we can do. <laughs> uh, I do think we can fix it. So a couple of thoughts. These are my thoughts. These are not um, law. This is not law. This is something I'm bringing to you. But how can we make patents great again? And in my opinion, we cannot sit and wait for courts. The courts, as I said, they're just going to continue to mess it up. Uh, we need Congress to really clarify in the law what the intent was and to very carefully craft the legislation because sometimes they make errors and, and the judicial side misinterprets the law, uh, in my opinion. Uh, but some of the things we need, injunctive relief. We need to reestablish the presumption of injunctive relief. The entire purpose of having a patent is to be able to exclude others from practicing your invention. That means you should be able to have injunctive relief if you can convince a jury in a court to uh, fine for your, on your side in a patent infringement matter. Also, fast patent issuance. Again, back in Reagan's day, two years uh, you know, seems a little more reasonable to me. Four, five, seven years is... It's unreasonable. People are waiting around for a patent. They can't raise money. They can't 
uh, that they're hesitant to put any more investment in it than is minimally required. I think fast uh, disposition of patent rights is going to be key. And then I have over here a kind of box because I'm somewhat on the fence, but um, I am throwing these ideas around. That's a limited PTAB. Again, I think the PTAB can do an excellent job in many areas, but I think uh, uh, there certainly are, are things we can limit in terms of their power or make them follow certain procedures uh, in order to uh, better adjudicate uh, uh, patent rights, especially issued patent rights, which should be held to a much higher standard than a pending application. So uh, again, I think there's a need for a PTAB. I think ex parte appeals are key. Derivation proceedings, they can do a good job. They didn't do a good job in mine. But uh, consented trials, I, I call consented trials um, where a patent owner wants to re-examine their own patent in order to bolster its strength. That would be consented. A patent owner is consenting to the PTAB to make a determination as to validity of their own patent. Um, usually patent, I, I advise clients actually to uh, do another search of the prior art before filing a litigation or sometimes hiring a, a search firm to try to invalidate your own patent so that you can do your own re-exam without having a, a, a third party opponent involved and try to bolster the, the value of your patent before you file litigation. Um, so that's about it for the patent law side and I'll go ahead and talk a little bit about my myself. So. Uh, so I went to San Diego State, I majored in chemical physics, and I worked as an engineer uh, in the medical device and diagnostic space. And uh, I enjoyed it, but I really didn't like working in a lab. Uh, I was an inventor, and as an inventor, my company sent me to uh, um, uh, obtain an intellectual property certificate at UCSD. It's more of a paralegal program, but I learned a lot about intellectual property. And I loved it so much, I sat and I passed the patent bar exam and became a patent agent. Then after becoming a patent agent, I decided I, I got to go to law school. I love this so much more than an engineering lab. So I went ahead and did that, I became a patent attorney, and I started Coastal Patent Law Group. Um, local law firm, I've been doing this 10 years. It, it used to be called Coastal Patent Agency when I was an agent, now it's Coastal Patent Law Group. And not only do I practice patent prosecution, I do licensing, uh, I do some corporate entity formation, I've done uh, a lot of negotiations and licensing deals um, representing the patent holders. Um, I also do trademarks and trademark trials. Um, so Coastal Patent Law Group is my law firm and if I don't win the election that's what I'll be doing. A little more Coastal Patent Law Group and probably some more surfing and spending time with my family. Uh, but as you can see over here I've taken the plunge and uh, I decided I'm going to run for Congress. Um, I mentioned I'm a Republican. I'm a conservative Republican. I believe in uh, um, individual freedom, personal accountability, low taxes, a small government, and a strong military. Those are kind of the five core principles of, on every issue that I, that I look to apply. Uh, I'm a little bit of, I probably am the most moderate of the Republicans. I like to tell people I'm fiscally responsible but socially balanced. I'm a surfer, I mentioned, so I'm, a, I'm opposed to offshore drilling. Um, I'm, I'm pretty big on the environment. I'm opposed to Mexico dumping sewage in the Tijuana River. It's making border patrol agents uh, ill. It's making surfers ill. And the problem is making me ill. <laughs> so, uh, so that's a, another issue I'm pretty big on. So locally, I'm, I'm kind of about supporting our environment. Um, but I think we need a balanced budget. So we really need to be cautious about how we spend our, our funding. And I think. Uh, a little bit more Reagan -esque. I, I, uh, in my In my home, we have a balanced budget. Sure, there are times when we make a big purchase and we either finance a vehicle or we put something on a credit card, but we know we're going to make the payment. We know we're going to pay it off. Um, so uh, in, in the government, it seems like they're overusing deficit spending, which is essentially the equivalent. And they're just spending, spending, spending with no plan to ever pay it off. And uh, Warren Buffett actually said, well, you just print more money. That's how you solve it, right? Well, what happens when you do that? Then everybody's money's devalued and you basically ruined the, the uh, economic uh, viability of everybody in this room. So again, um, I am running for Congress. District 49, it spans Del Mar up to San Juan Capistrano. Um, so also, I am sticking around. I want to join the Inventors Forum. No matter what happens in this election, I'm going to stay active with you guys. And I am a patent attorney, so um, if you want some free advice, catch me while I'm here. And I'd be happy to give you any sort of free advice you might need. Um, I've done it all. For, I, I, so one of my products is the Rinse Hanger. It's kind of a consumer product, so I'll mention that. I have some technology products too, but 
The rinse hanger is a wetsuit hanger. Uh, it's blow molded, so I have contacts in, in blow molding. I know how to blow mold products and make them ho hollow products. And it's a hanger you hang your wetsuit on after surfing. You connect the hose and it rinses the inside. You disconnect the hose, connect your gun, and you rinse the outside. And you just hang it to dry. So it's the rinse hanger, R-I-N-S-E, hanger. Uh, dot com. And I basically did everything from inventing it, patenting it, um, engineering, making the tooling, making the inventory. I worked with distributors and then I decided not to work with distributors and I could tell you that story. I uh, um, now sell direct to uh, customers on Amazon. Amazon's a whole other animal to learn, mm -hmm. but uh, it can be very valuable and, and an excellent skill to learn how to navigate Amazon as a merchant. Um, so I have a wide uh, uh, number of, res of, of experiences that can help any of you that are looking to uh, go down any of those rail roads. In the CBD space, kind of funny you mentioned that, I actually discovered that certain cannabinoids bind allosterically to the mu opioid receptor. So traditionally scientists find a receptor has a orthosteric side and a ligand binds on it. I found these uh, compounds bind on an allosteric site, right? And the effect we're finding is uh, you can modulate opioid type therapy or what we call antinociception or reducing uh, uh, the, the feeling of pain with using less opioid drug and we're hoping to find even an instance with no opioid drug and I do have patents pending on that. <laughs> um, but that's a, that's a fun and exciting one. I also, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of a Dr. Kansius, he passed away unfortunately, but he was working on cancer therapies and he found metallic nanoparticle uh, uh, colloidal suspensions, he was injecting them in hot dogs. He would put them in an RF field, uh, and in the RF field, the uh, nanoparticles oscillate, they generate heat. He was cooking hot dogs w by injecting these nanoparticles and putting it in a radio frequency field, and his whole concept was, if he can get those in tumors, you can ablate cancer cells um, using RF energy. Okay. Well, I took that to another level. I thought, well, Dr. Kansas, that's genius, but what if you then put those nanoparticles in a polymer? Now we can melt and recrystallize a polymer using an RF field. And that application, I was working for a company at the time there in the vascular space. Uh, so I invented the glue that holds a valve inside of a stent uh, that's deployed percutaneously. So it's the percutaneously deliverable two-part heart valve. I invented the glue that's the nanoparticle polymer combination uh, that holds the valve seated in, in a stent. So I have a ton of experience and I'd love to share it with each of you. So uh, I'm going to stick around and if you would like to talk about any of that, you know, please come up and introduce yourself. So any questions for the candidate? First off, first off, first off. Yeah, why can't PTABs, uh, why can't they have a jury? Why can't they have a jury? Well, I think that they, first of all, you need to change some legislation. Yeah. Because uh, so as it is now, this PTAB takes your patent away and you don't have a jury. Right. There's no hearing. They're just not set up for that. Um, but so is that fair to have your personal property taken away? Absolutely by not. Okay. In fact, I think Seventh Amendment of the Constitution says you have a right to a jury. And mm -hmm. that's my opinion, and I'll, I'm sticking to it. And the lack of injunctive relief, you mentioned that, and as many of these people know, that's actually led to what's called efficient infringement. It's actually a tactic used now because they know a lot of small companies and inventors can't withstand this attack, and so it's, uh, it's been used. The one I have the biggest issues with are the uh, Alice Laws, and have they ever actually defined what an abstract idea is? Well, they've given guidance. I don't think that there's really a definition, but there certainly is used PTO guidance. They publish it on their website. I don't know if it's very helpful. They give a few examples of cases they have you know, used in the past, and maybe those are helpful. But I think you just have to argue that. Man, that's an ongoing thing. Alice rejections are a huge problem. If you speak with any patent attorney, they're going to tell you they get one every week. Um, so. Well, this is really debilitating to people that have software-based products because part of the objection that they have used is that it cannot, if a device stores, organizes, or uh, right, transitional. Anything to do with data, it's an abstract idea, which that's the concept for artificial intelligence and every other thing that has an algorithm in it that runs off of software. The fact that we've prohibited patents from being issued, last year the case for that MRI machine, for example. Yeah. Do you remember this instance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, 
<laughs> Sorry, I've taken the stage. Let's ask a few friends yeah. questions. Well, uh, I'm sure glad that you're uh, uh, running for office because um, outsiders, you know, like Adrian and so forth, you know, are trying to petition to get you know things changed, and it's way easier to change uh, you know the system from the inside, mm -hmm. um, especially if, you know when you get in office, the ability to to navigate the system and kind of hasten and quicken the repair of um, our degraded, you know, patent system from the last decade or so uh, yeah. is terrific, and that you're a local guy is even better. And being able to keep the, the group informed, um, you know, through time as to how things progress and stuff. Yes, is really sure, insane. indeed. Yeah, and I've got to say also, Daryl Isa, you know, um, he's in my party, but I got to tell you, that guy sponsored the Parts Act. You know about the Parts Act? It's an automotive act where I think design patents is specific to, but it basically says you can't sue for design patent infringement on automotive parts. Yeah. And this guy made million, hundreds of millions of dollars off of uh, licensing patents, and here he is. It's because he's in the auto industry, right? He's, he's probably, uh, he didn't anyway. Treat, he didn't treat our leader too good in relation to some of the history of that. So. You and Adrian can speak privately about Well, he was actually smart enough to patent, and I wasn't. I built 500 car alarms five years before you really? created a patent. Yeah, it's wow. exactly the same. Yeah. But my car alarm was knocked off, then he knocked that off. Right, right. Um, well, sorry that happened to you. Oh, well, 56 million a year. Come on, yeah, everybody's right. got that. I, I saw another question. <laughs> yeah. I might be misunderstanding, but when you talk about the patents being private as opposed to public, oh. how I mean, how would that, that's going to change? Yes, yeah. it's going to disincentivize every inventor. It's going to make every investor leave this country. It's going to kill the whole founding father's idea that we should be able to prosper from the labors of our mind. Mm -hmm. That is what Section 8 says is we have the right. The only place in the Constitution the word right is even used. And this law, this case is challenging that law. Are you talking about to, to make it private as opposed to yes. public? Yes, so I think well, my legal opinion as a lawyer is that patents are private rights. Oh. Uh, but the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit has uh, decided a case and said that they are public rights. And it's really complicated how they arrive at that decision, but uh, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, we, I've studied it, studied it, said it, I cannot. So you're saying that um, you believe it should be private. Private rights. But if it is private, let's say it goes to private, how is that going to be good for the inventor? Because they it's won't not. know how all the different products, technology is being done because they won't have access. Oh, what I mean by a private right, it means the right is privately held. You still have to publish your publications oh, okay. and things. I yeah. thought you were saying. So I went through that kind of fast, so I apologize. I was didn't have a whole lot of time. But, I get it. Um, the, you know, that case, uh, uh, Oil States is the one that's, you know, started all of this about you know, are patents a private or a public right? And the reason they're, the lawyers are, are, are making such a big deal out of it, or they were, uh, is because a private right is treated differently than yeah. a public right. Absolutely. In other words, administrative agencies are allowed and authorized to dispose of, create, and invalidate uh, public rights. Uh, but private rights uh, have constitutional protections which require those be adjudicated in a Article Three court and the property owner to have a right to a trial by jury before that right is taken from them. So that's why it's a big, you know, if we call it a private right, you have a lot more protection. If we call it a, pro a public right, the USPTO can do whatever they exactly. want. Exactly. That's right. One last question. Just, just one. You've had your question. One. Point. Go ahead. Advantages for some companies that have the resources to make it a proprietary product and not patent it and keep everything secret to themselves. That's called a trade secret when yeah. you do that. And I actually often recommend that in your internal processes or your supply chain. Um, sometimes you can keep components. If you have a, an assembly that you're selling, sometimes you can keep certain components secret that are inside. Nobody really finds out about it. I guess they could take it apart and maybe figure out. But certainly your processes of how you manufacture things. Sometimes you'll find it's better and more efficient to manufacture things a certain way. Don't patent that. <laughs> Keep that in house, and, and it lasts forever. A patent's good for 20 years. A trade secret's good as long as you can keep it secret. Mm -hmm. They still don't know what the recipe for Coca-Cola is. 
Well, I think that, uh, that's interesting you say that, because I read that some uh, chemist used, uh, I don't know if it's FTIR or some sort of an instrumental analysis to... A new spectrogram. Is that what it is? So they, they don't know the process of how it's made, but they know exactly what's in it. So, so to my point about keeping the process secret, nobody knows the exact process. They keep that secret. And the other thing is if you do have a trade secret, if you do have something confidential, Make uh, make everyone who works for you or that's that you have to tell to a manufacturer or whatever sign an agreement of confidentiality yeah. because then you can get them on trade secret <coughs> misappropriation if they end up uh, divulging that information later on. Thank you so much. Yeah. Excellent presentation. Excellent information. And I'm sticking around so if you have more questions, come find me. Thank you. We appreciate you joining the group and keeping us linked in to this sort of stuff. It is. It is that important. All right. So let's see. Uh, did all right. Getting there. Getting there. Getting there. Hey, it works. All right. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. Okay, folks. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to go through this a little bit quicker because time's running out and I do want to have our little addition to it all. Uh, anybody not getting the newsletter? That's the address. Oh, one second. Ta da! It works. That's uh, the current uh, issues uh, address. If you haven't gotten this month's newsletter, please dial it in there. As far as resources here in San Diego go, uh, I do offer myself one hour on Thursdays. Uh, that might get diminished, but uh, the point is to come in and we'll try to see uh, where you're at and where you're trying to go and how we can help you get it there. Um, I also offer these sheets outside here, which is uh, the, the basics of what are the five steps to get from you're just starting to you're ready to present. Uh, th there is also a grading sheet out here, it's a matrix that if you've never had your idea evaluated, you can start yourself by looking at these different areas and follow the instructions here to figure out how your product actually scores. I'm going to segue now though because as far as resources go, we have two people that came to join us here tonight that came from afar and you'd like to do a shout out. I know you had to take off and... Uh, sure, if you want or next time too, whatever whatever's best. Well, you came your long ways and I'd like you to right now is a great enough time to give a little shout out, explain what it is you offer as a resource to our inventors. Sure. So that's appropriate. Down here is fine? Yes, sure. we're, that's so, fine. I think mentioned, uh, so we have a, a product in, in, in the retail, uh, a manufacturer ourselves, we distribute ourselves, we figured out a long time ago that no one had the passion that Kree and I had, my wife and I had, for our product. We tried uh, originally with either you know, distributors, and what we found out was it, it, no meant no, and Kree and I know just means we'll ask you again later. Uh, so Kree and I, by ourselves, we, like I said, we manufacture, we distribute it, and this has been about a decade we've been working on, on Hangomatic. We've already pre-sold Hangomatic Stud to uh, Home Depot, Bed Bath & Beyond, so we're hoping that we'll, you know, further increase our, our company. So we did everything ourselves. We, we, we were not uh, willing to license for the offers that were made to us because we thought, and we were right, that the deals got a lot sweeter as, as we picked up more and more speed. So this year we're anticipating selling almost 300,000 Hangomatics. Hmm. Hopefully Hangomatics that'll be out getting a lot of pressure from the retailers, but Q3 or Q4, uh, it'll just be a more professional version of my current, my current tool. And we also work with some inventors on their products. What Kareem and I, spent a lot of time with now is over the last decade we gave away so much money uh, to people that uh, fake promises, fake promises mm -hmm. uh, people that said if you give me this I'll do this and it's horrible we, we learned that we will learn the, the hard way and what we've developed over the last 10 years is we're really good at knowing what what right and wrong is who could trust who cannot trust what someone says and what's happened is, is adventures especially younger adventures reach out to us and ask us questions. And we, we spend a lot of time on the phone and on email. We always take a call. We always spend time because we never had that. And, and people that we thought we had that with ended up being sharks. I mean, we lost a lot of money uh, over the years. And, and now we're a lot more savvy. Hangomatic stud is moving fast and, and we know what we're doing now. So the pitch to get rich uh, rich meaning rich content, is a website that Korean and I put together where we do YouTube videos and Facebook videos 
on topics that people ask us to do. So um, sales 101, uh, how to pitch. And, 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 and if, if you look at the content, it's a little bit silly, a little bit fun, but you gotta remember as you know, we're trying to entertain. Very silly. Very silly. <laughs> but we have a little bit fun. We're, we're a married couple, we work together, so we fight. And, and we kind of put that out there, and, and we're very honest. And you'll see us fight a little bit, but you know, we're, you know, we're trying, to, trying to hold your attention as well as you know, teach you something. So I would say, you know, just be aware, you know, we're trying to be appealing to all you know, the, the, the kids and, and all the way through, you know, through adults, so we're trying to be entertaining. Um, and then what else do we want to mention about well, The one thing I want to share with you, for those of you who are going to try to license or do this thing yourself and don't try and seek some kind of help, you have to learn how to pitch. That's the biggest thing you have to do. If anybody's either married or dating, when you met that girl or guy, you pitch. Right? You always pitch. If you go to Walmart to find the products that are already selling and contact those manufacturers, you have to pitch. Nobody wants to hear, hi, I have a good idea that I think you're gonna like. What the hell are you talking about? What is your idea? Don't lose that opportunity to say what it is that you want. What are you selling? What did you make? Nobody cares about your idea. They wanna know what it is, what it could do. And the most important, why should they write you back? Why should they give you five, five minutes of their day? Why? What did your product solve? Who is it for? And how is that going to make them money? Why should somebody license your idea when you, the product hasn't done anything? There's no proof, right? Why should they sit in this chair? What chair breaks? Like, they just don't know anything, right? So they're not going to just invest in you without knowing the why, the who, the when, the where, how many, how much, and how are they going to make it? We get emails all the time, and sometimes we feel like we're. we're pulling it out of people, what is your product? Right. Find your name is John, find it's the incinerator. But that doesn't tell me anything. So, so I, I think the point is, is when you have the opportunity to tell to someone, to show it to someone, get to the point. You can introduce yourself later. Hi, my name's John, this is my product, and this is what it does. Right, I liked how you present your speech, and then at the end you're like, let me tell you about myself. <laughs> like, good, you got out all the important things. <clears throat> Who cares about you, right? It's after, because you want to, well, it's attention span. Attention right. span. You want the, the people to hear your speech and what you have to say, and that's the most important part. The let me tell you my company name. It comes later because you you got to get their attention. And as inventors, it doesn't come natural. I, I'm I'm more of the inventor, and it, it, speaking out loud does not come natural to me. I have to drink a couple coffees and have a little caffeine in me. I'm introverted. So for us inventors out there. I feel like when you're invention minded, you're probably also not salesy or aware of the pitch. So that's what we've been trying to develop and help people that are more like me. This one could talk forever. Um, she's always great at talking. And we've been trying to develop it for everyone else. So, All right. Well, great yeah. points. Very great Thank points. You. Are you guys willing to come back and actually give us a presentation oh, so yeah. we can get a little dive in a little deeper sure. and learn? A little, uh, that'd be awesome. That'd be great. Yeah, I, I just like look to forward know what to that. Does. See, oh. so when okay. he's see, yeah. pitching, I'm so sorry. when he stood up and introduced himself and <laughs> Hangomatic, <laughs> what the hell is Hangomatic? Well, I didn't want it to be about me. I, <laughs> I do want well, to know about So that, I was trying not to make it about me. I wanted it to be about, about what we could help other people with. They've got a fabulous uh, collection of videos available online. You guys have really done a great job, and you're continually producing these really informative, and they are fun videos. So I invite you all to watch all that. I can tell you it's a six-foot tape measure that levels and marks the wall at the same time. So you can mm -hmm. oh, wow. yeah. Puts two little marks on the wall. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Welcome to our group. Just and the yeah. pitch is getrich.com. Okay. So or, or my product's anglemat.com and it'll link you back. Okay. We just have a babysitter who's saying, get home, so <laughs> we have to run. We'll see you next time. Thank you much. We look forward to that next, and we're Facebook, your next visit. We do Facebook Live every yeah. Friday. Thanks for joining. And, uh, interview other inventors. Thank you. We'll see you next month. Thank you. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks again for having us. Welcome, dear. Thank You're welcome. you. Bye for now. Josh. Oh well. Okay. Uh, our other resources, the Inventors TV. I'm going to go through this really quick because most of you that have been here have seen these slides. If anything catches your attention, follow back up with me and I'll get back to you. This is a list of all the incubators and sports innovators group, maker place, places that help inventors. The uh, group for women we talk about every month is the Hera Labs, fantastic organization. SCORE, Service Corps of Retired Executives, you probably know them. Axion is uh, the group that does microloans. $300 to $750,000, no, 75000 
and they qualify you. Make sure you're SBA uh, qualified. Uh, Amazon, as was mentioned, is its own business. They love to teach you how to do it. Every month I tell you about Harry West and how he teaches innovation. has a fantastic video uh, about that process. He invented the Swifter Duster. Uh, we do talk about Stephen. He will be a speaker here. His book is One Simple Idea. And if any of you are thinking about licensing and just getting started, oh, please read his book first. This is the number one suggestion I give uh, when you come to come to me for that free hour. Is uh, if you're going to license, read Stephen's book. It's now uses textbooks in colleges. It's just that great a book. Um, we are here. We're uh, a pipeline into some other groups in San Diego uh, that can help you. Uh, Connect is a big one. They do help you build your company, your team, uh, and your business plan by going through a series of panels. Uh, what it takes is for you to qualify is uh, a screening panel where we grade you to see how far along you are on all of these areas. And this is a mild grading uh, scheme here. Uh, the question that's not on here is are you coachable? Because <laughs> these people are giving their time free for to help you get through this program. Uh, they can then, if you get through it and you've got your plans ready, uh, connect you to Capital Match, Tech Coast Angels. Uh, what does fun ready mean? Uh, it really means you've done a lot of homework. Now, this is why people take licensing, okay? This next slide is why most people license. This is what's expected of you if you're going to start a business. This much homework on every one of these levels, and you're scored. And if you're not a 95 on this, you're not even looked at, okay? So, again, it's not a get-rich-quick scheme. Uh, I am just, I, I've started a dozen companies, and I'm just now embarking to start out a whole nother very high-tech uh, endeavor and uh, we have to go through every single one of these steps and it's going to be a year and a half before we're even funded probably so it's a commitment so you have to be passionate and you have to really want it okay opportunities uh, the United Renters Association has great opportunities we've got the hardware show international hardware show uh, in Las Vegas uh, the MTC used to be called the Response Expo. This is the Direct Response TV World. Uh, Going to be right here in San Diego looking for license, uh, products to license. So uh, there are a couple of you I know have actually uh, gotten the booth. Last year it was uh, Mr. Garcia, Dan, with his Sipsy Bottle Stopper. And you got a four foot space and you set up a little area like this and people walk by. Well, he was discovered, in fact, was chosen to pitch right then and there at the end of the event. And you heard him talk here just a couple weeks ago. It's, he's continuing to get uh, closer into the market. So it's a fantastic opportunity for you to show your wares uh, for license agreements. I am actually going to be a judge again this year. I'm very proud to do that. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll see you there. Uh, other opportunities for invest inventors, if you're in the high-tech world, I hope you know about SBIR, Small Business Innovation Research Grants. If you don't, come talk to me about it. A lot of doctors in town have made their whole livings off of that. And then there's a slew of reality TV shows, and we've got the casting calls for it. So if you want to get on TV, come talk to me. We'll figure out what show might be appropriate and how, what, the, what the avenue is to get in there. So these are all uh, casting shows. Why do they do this? Because this is how our country works. This is the root of capitalism, is come up with new products and get people to want them, and they go and buy them. All right. Bottom line is America depends on your ideas. OK? Questions and answers? Maybe one, two. Yes, sir. Is this available, this presentation? That you know, we're filming the whole thing live. So it'll be there. Yes. Yes. The, uh, oh, any other questions? I'm, it's 9 o'clock, so I want to wrap up in about 15 minutes. Sorry, we went over a little bit. Are there any questions? General, anything of anything? Yes. Uh, I, think, I believe it's like the past three slides. What was that competition? The one where the, the guy had the table? That's actually called the uh, MTC, Media Technology. It used to be Response Expo. It's actually the, as seen on TV industry, all the leaders, they're having a convention. And the club, the, the, the group called America, US, <laughs> UIA uh, makes available little booths, four foot, half, they're half tables. And they're very cheap, they're a few hundred dollars. And that allows you to set up your wares and people from the industry are walking by. I've seen Lisa Gibbons there with a camera crew and ABC News. It's, it's, it's a very interesting event. And you might, in fact, uh, be discovered. Or you can walk around and find people in the industry make those contacts so it's a it's a it's a big event there was a there was a time and date on 
on one of those slides uh, with the next one that you're talking about. Here. Yeah, this and one is uh, coming up. This is uh, this month. I think it's the uh, no, 26th or 28th. Yeah, 25th and 26th. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, check out mtcshow.com uh, forward slash inventors. Yes. Um, was our club going to be offered a, a free passes for the. Uh, oh, no. Program? No. Okay. I invite you to call Kathy and find out. I, I just don't know, but um, why don't you suggest that a little bit earlier next year and we'll make sure there is a way to do that because that's not a far stretch and we probably yeah, could have made some range. I if, if it was 30 or $100 or something. I, I, I don't know, think so. But, don't well, uh, you know, send me an email out of fact and I'll find out. But. Uh, yeah, they really should give us a discount. Well, we're going to associate a lot closer next year. So, okay, uh, yeah, depart, uh, small business information research, a lot of television shows. Uh, it's becoming a, a fad to invent, and so it, it is very, very, very popular. Any more questions? Questions about anything in general? Okay. Who needs who? This is always the fun part. So. Now is a great time that if uh, you are looking for some help, uh, please sign up and say what kind of help are you looking for. If we can right now, we'll connect you. If not, it's caring with us. And as we travel, we'll hopefully uh, meet some people we can connect you to. So that said, who needs the what? Yes, Matt, what you looking for? Um, so I'm looking for help in licensing my hat. Uh, I've read Stephen Key's book. Uh, I've gotten a little bit of extra input, learned uh, how to put together a hit list tonight, but uh, love some personal touch in going through the process because I still am new to it and never done it before. So I've learned experience to be very, very valuable. The, uh, I don't get anything out of pitching and vent rights, so don't get me wrong, but they actually have a course now that is, uh, it's like twenty nine ninety five. Dan, isn't that it? Dan stepped out. Okay, he's out there. Um, anyway, they will hold your hand and take you through the whole process, and that's why you see them testimonies once a week now, because they have coaches. That's what they sell is coaching. And it's 2900 bucks. but if you've never been through it, once you've been through it, you learn all of their trips, tips and tricks and techniques. Um, can anybody else assist you? You have a hand so, Matt, right there. I, I have a toy company that's 25 years old. Mm -hmm. and I've been making, licensing, manufacturing, and distributing my own toys for 25 years. Awesome. There's a connection. And if you just come to me afterwards, I might have some yeah. opportunities for you. Perfect. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank Anybody you so much. in the toy business that uh, has any kind of, needs any kind of help with toys, low tech, please. Not What's your name? Not too many batteries. Mark. Right. <laughs> Mark. I didn't recognize you. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, so a lot know, of years we've been doing this. Little low tech toys. They don't know what to do with. Uh, I can point you in the right direction. So indeed, you can. Very good. Well, thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, the term was a uh, patent broker. If you wanted to license your patent. What about it? <laughs> oh, I came here last time looking for a patent broker. Yeah. Find somebody who takes my patent and finds somebody to buy it. Google search. So. I, uh, yeah, nope. That's a, that's worth a Google search, I'm sure. I'm not in favor of those. They're taking your money when you could be doing this yourself, so. No, that's good. Who else needs something, wants something? <laughs> okay. Getting a little tired. It's after nine, I know. Had a lot of content, a lot of information. Well, I want to burn off your ears. I mean, I want to uh, tell you that uh, we still need you to care about the patent system. Let me see if Josh is going to come in here or not. Because, uh, excuse me, Josh, did you want to hear what we do as far as talking about this whole time issue? Yes, yes. Okay. Excuse us, yeah. 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 All right. <clears throat> we just completed what we do here, uh, Josh, is what we call Foodie 2, and a few people had some uh, requests, and one or two got connected. That's great. Uh, so, my time to uh, tell you what we need from you is your care and your passion and concern about our American patent system. You heard a great talk tonight about these issues. Uh, a number of us have been worried and concerned about this now for years. As I said, I sat here in the audience and watched when Daryl Issa first brought this issue up. And uh, where it all started for me was this gentleman here, Randy Landrenu, who back in the spring of 2015 invited me to fly into Washington. 
inventors. And they were trying to pass a rule called HR9 at the time, which was going to make it that they could actually pierce your corporate veil, break all the anonymity rules, and actually go after your investors if you lost a law case in patent court. And this bill had actually passed the Congress and was headed for the Senate. And we showed up, and we were the first people that they'd ever heard from that weren't lobbyists. So after our fly-in, we were actually get, they actually tabled HR 9. And until this time, everything you've heard tonight about all these rules that have been changing were just building and getting worse and worse for the American inventor. So this was the first time inventors stood up in Washington, D.C. for our rights. This was the spring of 2015. Uh, I, was in, I did meet Paul, who founded this group that we're going to talk about USI. Uh, I did join with him to go to Washington. We did start protesting across from Daryl Ice's meetings when he would publish them. He quit publishing them. Uh, we went to as many events as we could and made as much noise as we could here locally to try to bring attention to this issue. Unfortunately, everybody knows the Cardassians just had a baby yesterday, but nobody knows that the patent laws are ready to ruin the whole country. Priorities, people, come on. Okay, we came up with this idea that we need to create a petition because we have to get people together in groups. There's a couple of big major inventor groups in this country, and then there's clubs like us. So my concept was let's get the groups together first. So we created the petition that picked on the first five most horrendous issues that we were trying to fight. We believe the PTAP should be eliminated because any other administration could come in and reverse the rules on us. So we have big issues with PTAPs. The abstract idea, again, it's not even defined, and things like MRI machines aren't getting patents now because there's software in it. Without injunctive relief, there's efficient infringement. It's cheaper for a company to knock you off than to develop something themselves, especially if you can't still end up and fight it. We're not in favor of accelerated examination. I know you got it, but frankly, that's usually abused by the bigger corporations that can shell out the thousands of dollars. Most inventors, eh, even that little bit of extra is not fair. First to file, again, the fact that a company was uh, invested in, the investment uh, notices got published. The patent office is saying, well, that was showing it to the public. It's not. The invention was never shown. It was just the securities notes. So that's absolutely ridiculous. This first to file is what's happened to that. Well, we got this petition together, and what happened is we were able, I was successful in getting some of the biggest groups in the country together. We were able to get Stephen Key with InventRight. We were able to get uh, Lewis Foreman, who, if you look back on the picture of when AIA passed, Lewis Foreman was standing next to Obama getting his hand shaking, thinking this was a great idea. Well, he's had enough change of heart now that he's turned around and is supporting this reform bill. A couple other major groups came about, and again, we now have, for the first time in history, the groups in the country united for, for a purpose. It wasn't enough. We had to bring more attention to this issue. A group of us decided to protest, and here we are actually burning our patents on the step of the patent office, because to us, these are liabilities. I go out and patent something now, I can get challenged and put into a contest I can't afford to pay. And I'll lose all my intellectual property because of that. And it will cost me my life, my home, everything, trying to defend something I get wiped out by a bigger company. Patents can be liabilities now. This isn't right, it isn't fair. So we made an issue about it, and we were not blackballed, but USI's got a black eye saying, you guys are too radical. Well, somebody had to stand up and wake people up. Nobody else was. Well, what we didn't know, and I just learned the other day, is USPTO saw all of this. They saw what we're doing. And like I started this whole meeting out by saying, Director Ayanku has made the most bold statement he made in the last 10 years saying we can't continue this path. It's because the people in that building over here, the patent office, they are embarrassed. They are ashamed. They are worried they may not have a job now because of how bad things have gotten. And they are willing to talk to us. So we have to quit this rubbing the salt in the wound sort of thing, going, you know, you really screwed us up. Well, so USI is uh, very active in this. I'm very proud to be a, a member and a part of this group. Uh, it is, again, because of this ruling right here, Article 1, Section 8, the only place in the Constitution where right is written, and that was to grant you the right to prosper from your ideas. Now, 
we are in fact facing a horrific, horrific decision if the Supreme Court decides that they should be public rights instead of private rights. What incentive do you have if you can't own your own ideas anymore? If you can't profit off your ideas anymore, what incentive is there? This is why the founding fathers made this rule is because when they lived in King George time and he took everything you made and owned, they started going, you know, this, isn't, this doesn't help me. Why should I do anything? He came to this country knowing Giving the people the incentive to profit off their own ideas would help build a great nation, and it did. Okay. So hopefully that decision does go in our favor. I'm sorry to see it going political, uh, but uh, I think it's going to be in May. Uh, one of the things I do is uh, amicus briefs. I've been signing a couple of them on different cases. I'm getting very involved with that. The U.S. inventor continues to try to lead the way with the most... Uh, 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 inclusive rule. Our bill hasn't been brought to the floor yet, but we are going to bring it up next week uh, because uh, we're believing that even stronger measures have to be taken than the Stronger Patent Act. Stronger Patent Act will probably go through, it'll probably pass, and then we're going to amend it until it's really right. That's what it amounts to. And absolutely, this Congress is done for. We still have ISA and Goodlot in, in office, and they'll, down, they'll vote anything down that has to do with changing, so we have to wait till the next administration. So anyway, we continue uh, to go to D.C. and next week on Wednesday, this group was the last group that assembled, about 10 of us. Next week on Wednesday, there should be like 35 inventor and inventor club leaders going to the halls of Congress and walking and talking to our representatives. This will be the biggest collection of inventors the House has ever seen, the Hill's ever seen. And we will be there with our little cards explaining exactly what our positions are. So we are going to have our voices heard, okay? Because as it is now, people aren't caring enough anymore to even go to Washington to talk to their congressmen. I do. You do. We know you. That's what makes you a patriot. Again, I'm very happy about the fact that we were now able to get the clubs together in what's called the Inventors Groups of America. Stephen Key helped us get this together. So this is now the community of inventors across the country, tens of thousands of us are now united. We're going there next week. Here's the agenda. I'm actually one of the speakers. Very proud to represent you folks, okay? Uh, we are gonna have an opportunity to have some people that have been the most affected by these patent laws actually speak out and tell and talk about these things. Uh, and we're gonna have the top people at the patent office talking to us. So that's the first day. And the second day is up on the hill. Um, there is a trailer, there is a movie being made about this. Uh, Tea Party is actually producing it, but it's uh, Save the Inventor gave us rights to some of their videos as well. So we are collectively now putting together some very powerful statements and testimonies that's going to come together in a movie you're going to see soon here called uh, Unprotected, the Shredding of the patent, U.S. Patent System. So there's the link to go see the little trailer for it. And yes, I'm ranting, I'm raving. All right, well, the point is, uh, Expressing your ideas is, is a fun thing to do, and we want to keep it that way and make it something that's still profitable. And we have to do this really fast. 48% of investment money going into artificial intelligence in China now means we're years, we've lost the race in so many areas right now. Hopefully we can restore it. That's why I need you to be interested and care and support our group, okay? There's a sheet out here where you can sign up for the both the uh, our, our newsletter here and for the uh, one, one of the other groups. There's a sign-up sheet out there. Please join. Please support us. Okay. Um, so there's a little survey form here. If you got some questions you'd like to ask, I want to thank you all for coming here tonight, and look forward to seeing you uh, next month. Thanks to AMN Healthcare, my company's A Squared. Again, I'm happy to show you a new product development plan. All in all, I hope you have an inventive day. See you next month. It's an interesting effect when I end the meeting about talking about all this patent stuff because it seems discouraging. This country has been through worse and harder times. We'll fix this. And it'll be gentlemen like Josh here that hopefully can help us do that. So we look forward to that time and day.